Thanks for watching. We appreciate you. Please, please subscribe. Seven dead in seven days. A stretch of domestic violence tearing through Central Texas. Monday, March 7th, clean firefighters rush to a house fire only to find Robin Ashford's body inside. Soon, it's actually a homicide investigation as police zero in on the woman's boyfriend. Friday, March 11th, Colleen police find a 29-year-old dead, saying he took his own life. But a short distance away, they soon find a 25-year-old Neosha Johnson, the man's girlfriend. Police believe he killed her before shooting himself. Saturday, March 12th, cousins Michaela Martin and Alyssa Whitfield are killed inside their home in Colleen. Police say Michaela's stepfather pulled the trigger. And finally, Monday, March 14th, Teresa Vise and Kimberly Gorski are shot to death in a Waco apartment. Authorities say Gorski's husband, who is also Vice's son, is responsible for their murders. Every one of these deaths tragically tied to domestic violence, a growing crisis now impacting Central Texas. This is not going to be your normal 10 p.m. newscast. Tonight we want to shed a light on something that's sadly happening far too often in our communities domestic violence. Now the odds are good it's happening somewhere in your neighborhood right now. Maybe it's even happening to someone you know or yourself. Tonight we're focusing on what to look for and how you can get help. Now if you need help, don't be afraid to ask for it. All night long we'll have the National Domestic Violence Hotline in the top right of your screen. If you scan the QR code there, it'll also take you to the hotline's website. This year, Colleen has racked up nearly a dozen murders in just three months. Through all of last year, they only saw 18. Police say domestic violence is playing a direct or indirect role in a lot of these. Tonight, 25 News reporter Jarrell Baker tells us more about the sharp rise. A city in tears after weeks filled with deadly violence, including a string of five deaths in seven days earlier this month. I know that she's in a better place. They still look down on us. Well, 11-year-old Michaela Martin and 6-year-old Alyssa Whitfield, just two of the four victims who lost their lives due to domestic violence. I saw it, and I was, like, just in heartbreak because I, I can't stand what I've done to her. Nothing could happen still. Neighbors still have precious memories of the two cousins, tragically torn from their family and the community. I remember them just always playing their hoverboard on the with the seat. They'd be riding it down our road and then walking in their pajamas on their phone with their mom walking the dog. We see the kids playing outside, passing our house, and also the um, son would be playing with them. Those will be their last memories as their mothers plan to leave the city. She's not going to have a home because the home is his and she doesn't want to be there anyway. And the sister definitely doesn't want to be here. So they're going to be moved, so they need to relocate, they need to bury their children, you know, medical expenses. Obviously, when we see those those cases, you know, it, it challenges everybody, everybody in the city, everybody in the police department, of what could we have done? Is there anything that we could have done to prevent that? Colleen police confirmed they received 19 calls for service at the victim's home since 2017, leading many to ask why the police didn't step in sooner. Sometimes it, there's actions that can be done by the police and sometimes there's not actions that can be done because it's not a criminal act. Um, two people arguing not, is not necessarily a criminal act and when it becomes physical that's when it becomes criminal. Sergeant Neil Holtzclaw with the Violent Crimes Unit says police officers try to step in and mediate domestic situations but until the crime happens their hands are tied. Unfortunately with the, the domestic incidents. Um, it, it has caused a, a significant rise in the homicide rate here in Queen, and it is something that we're definitely working to combat. 
Hope's Paul says they offer victim services to help those in domestic situations. I know a lot of times people don't want to report to law enforcement, but we do have a victims liaison that they can call and speak to, and it doesn't have to be to law enforcement, it can be to them. Susanna Amore with Families in Crisis says oftentimes victims are afraid to speak up in fear of what may happen to them or their kids. And with that, the most important thing is not to try to tell them what to do because no one knows better than that survivor what that batterer is capable of. And we might be giving them advice that might be might create the situation to ask them. Most people in domestic violence situations hide their feelings, their pain, and their suffering when in public. Amor says it's important to be a listening ear and create a safe space for them to speak up. Due to the rise in domestic violence cases the last few years, police departments in Central Texas are changing the way they respond to crime. For Waco PD, its Victim Services Unit takes a survivor approach. 25 News reporter Alicia Desperado gives us an inside look. Domestic violence, a growing concern around the country and right here in Waco. That's where the award-winning Waco PD Victim Services Unit comes in. We are a resource for victims and witnesses of, of crime. They visit with an average of about 600 victims in person each year, plus an additional 1,500 phone calls. Now, of those numbers, about a quarter of them do deal with domestic and family violence. It happens with your neighbors, with your coworkers. You may not always know about it. Your victims typically are afraid to speak out. They're afraid of safety concerns. Melissa Bethesda says between the fear and manipulation from an abuser, it takes an average of seven police visits before a victim will ask for help. Typically with a family violence victim, you can see a pattern. A pattern that has to kind of play out. They have to reach a limit and have to be done with it. Once they do reach that limit, victim services can help direct them to resources like counseling, financial assistance, and places like the Family Abuse Center. They offer housing and support for men and women of all ages on their path to recovery. We are all creatures of belonging and wanting to uh, have support from others. And if we feel isolated and feel like there's no one to turn to, it's very easy to continue to stay stuck and feel like there's no one to turn. Victims in Waco do have options for help, and there's hope for healing as soon as they're ready to accept it. Coming here, being able to say, enough is enough. Um, wanting to work towards putting your life back together. Our staff here is available and ready to help support you in whatever you're needing to get to that place to become free from domestic violence. And for those who aren't ready yet, hope is just a phone call away. Chances are someone you know is a victim. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, 20 people are abused by an intimate partner every minute in the U.S. That equals more than 10 million people every year. A third of women and a quarter of men are victims of domestic violence. It is not just the big cities that are noticing and talking about domestic violence more recently. Rural areas know the pain all too well. Out in Coryell County, one Gatesville group is staying silent. No more. Main Street in Gatesville looks a lot like it did years ago. But small towns can hide big problems, and that's something Righteous Roots is trying to fix in rural Texas. It's a terrifying situation. Whenever it does happen, oftentimes we don't realize that we're in a, a, an abusive situation. Melody Webb and Gladys Wittenberg are the driving forces behind Righteous Roots Crisis Center, a domestic violence outreach post. We realized the need whenever we went through our own on crisis, there um, was not a lot of resources available. How common abuse is. The women are survivors themselves. When the center first opened four years ago, it was because they knew firsthand the limited resources available in more rural parts of the state where what happens behind closed doors tends to stay there. Places to go, ways to make money. Oftentimes women have children with them and they have been solely supported by the male in the house. The organization typically helps 60 to 75, mostly women, at any one time. There are also classes that focus on addiction, parenting, and even marriage counseling. But helping women find a path out of abuse and down a different road towards survival and a fresh start is what hits close to home. 
clear in navigating the waters like they are. Even though we've navigated the biggest part of, of what we went through, there's still so much to navigate. Yes, there's no doubt the community embraces the larger mission here. We couldn't do what we do without the support of our community. There's broken people everywhere. There's abused people everywhere. Helping to break the silence surrounding that other pandemic, abuse. One misconception when it comes to domestic violence is why don't victims just leave? You don't blame a victim for going through what they're going through. Because you don't even know how it is to try to get out. When we return, why leaving a violent household isn't always that simple. Plus, we'll be talking with a director from the Waco Family Abuse Center about the impact this is having in our community. Over the past year and a half, you've probably seen our coverage of Sakira Young. Her mother says she lost her life at the hands of her boyfriend back in 2020. 25 News reporter Angela Parsky sat down with her to talk about her daughter and why she wants to change the way we talk about victims. Prom photos are supposed to bring a smile to most mothers' faces. Her prom picture that everyone sees with her in the white dress, you know, she looks like an angel. But for Latoya Wells, this photo of her daughter, Sakira Young, brings pain. Because I'm already knowing she didn't show up for prom. She showed up for pictures, but she didn't show up for prom. Because she was calling her phone and calling her phone and making threats for her to come home. Sakira's mother says she was trapped in a violent, abusive relationship with her high school boyfriend for three years. I don't think she really realized it was like that until she was so far in. It was just so hard to get out of it. The then 21-year-old was killed just a year and a half ago. Her mother says it was while she was trying to escape. The ending well says most victims fear most. Right now, today, I would rather be talking to people about how my child got away, not about how she did it. Wells is now an outspoken advocate for domestic violence victims. She wants people to understand that victims often feel trapped and have no escape. It's not, it's not a smart thing to say, you know, um, she should have got out or she should have this. And you know, the whole thing is, he should have killed her. Her daughter's alleged abuser and killer now in jail, awaiting trial. I'm not, I'm not a person to sit and say I want someone's life to be taken. But in a situation like that, it's just so sad when the aggressor is the one that is still alive. And now. Uh, she didn't deserve to lose her life behind any of that. While she may not physically be here, Sakira lives on through the Forever Young Scholarship Foundation created by Tracy and Keith Guillory. And just knowing that she wasn't able to like, continue on makes me want to work harder, especially getting the scholarship. I feel happy, you know, that I can, in a way, carry on what she couldn't do. Wells knows that Sakira's story is making a difference. That's what helps me, you know, get by. And hopes to help people better understand victims of domestic violence. Her name, you know, is not forsaken, you know what I mean? She'll always be remembered and for good reason. Very powerful, Andrew. Thank you. Now, Sakira Young's story is not unique when we talk about victim shaming. It's actually more common than you think. And tonight I have Samantha Dietzler. She is the Director of Development with the Waco Family Abuse Center. And Samantha, thank you for joining us tonight. This, of course, is a very important topic. And I want to first talk about common misconceptions. A lot of people think that for victims, it's easy to leave a bad situation, which really isn't always the case. So can you debunk this myth? I think the biggest thing about what creates difficulty in leaving is often the isolation from families and friends. And then a lot of the times there are children involved as well. Over half the clients we have in our shelter are children. Um, it could also be finances, just having a safe person to get them there and things like that. So there's several factors. And also just general gaslighting and believing that maybe you owe your abuser something or things like that. It makes it more difficult for them to leave. And when we talk about domestic violence, a lot of people think physical abuse, but there are a lot of different types of violence that really fall under this umbrella. So can you tell me what those are and the signs associated? Mm -hmm. So yes, there's emotional abuse, there's spiritual and cultural abuse um, that often happens, financial abuse, um, even 
internet abuse, and then sexual abuse as well. So really, it can come in different forms. And with that, you're not always able to notice the signs because, you know, when it comes with physical abuse, you can often see injuries and things like that. So if it's someone that you might know, a lot of it is that isolating, withdrawing again, really ultimately comes down to the control. Um, it is a little bit difficult when you're on the outside to be able to see that, but just controlling every aspect, whether that's what they do, what they wear, when they go out places, if they get to go out places, and things like that. And so now that we really know the types of abuse and some of the signs, this is something that can be deadly. So let's talk about that. Yes, yeah, so in 2020, there was 228 um, deaths in the Texas County, um, and that is in multiple relationships. It's not just um, men and women. It can also be with family violence, family members, and things like that. Um, and often those altercations can involve like using a weapon, strangling, um, beating, and things like that. Okay. And so, you know, no one is immune to domestic violence. This is something that can affect anyone. Of course, women and children, which is common, but also the elderly and even men, which a lot of people don't really think about. Mm -hmm. Out of those 228 deaths in 2020, um, 40 of them actually were men. Um, and then also in terms of LGBTQ plus relationships, because we hear so much about a heterosexual relationships where the abuser is male and female, a lot of the times people in these relationships who um, might not be in a heterosexual relationship don't believe that it's happening to them because we're so used to seeing this other relationship. And they're also already fighting bias and stigma throughout the relationships in general. So sometimes it's harder for them to realize that they're in a situation like that. Well, very, very good information. Thank you so much for being here. As I said, uh, this can really make a difference, and I really hope that we can help someone out there who's watching this. Coming up next, how can domestic violence affect the biological makeup of the brain? With traumatic experiences, they are biological in nature and physiological. Next, we take a look at the science. Welcome back to our 25 News Domestic Violence Special. If you're just now joining us, Samantha Dietzler from the Waco Family Abuse Center is here with us tonight discussing how domestic violence impacts our brains. So Samantha, science actually shows that recurrent abuse really changes the physical makeup of our brains. And so can you explain to me the issues or mental health problems that you see in victims that come to you? Yeah, so the biggest thing is trauma and PTSD, and that extent is going to depend on how long they were in that relationship and how intense the abuse was. A lot of the times the response targets the brainstem, so the fight or flight response, and then the temporal lobe, so the emotions that come with that. So in instances of abuse, you will have like a chemical rush and everything, which kind of recircuits everything. So some of those effects that we see um, as a result of the PTSD is more anxiety, more depression sometimes. Um, personality disorders and switching like that, suicide ideation. And this can really affect especially children who yes. are still in that developmental phase. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. For children of abuse, especially if it takes a while for their parent to leave the situation, they kind of come to see it as normal and um, acclimate to this as well. Um, sometimes that leads to victims becoming abusers later in life, but really just relearning what healthy relations look like. It takes a long time for them to realize like all these behaviors are wrong. Okay. Well, Samantha, again, thank you for providing this insight tonight. This is a very, very important topic. And as I said prior, I really hope that this can help just one person. Well, as you just heard, domestic violence can change the development of the brain. Our Austin Walker takes a deeper look at the science. The brain is complex. It does a lot. Everything from telling you how to tie your shoes to how to feel. It tells you what to think. And if your brain is impacted, so is everything else. Trauma is stored in the nervous system. Looking at nationwide statistics by the Mayo Clinic, 48% of domestic violence survivors report episodes of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, many unable to process the previous events. 
With traumatic experiences, they are biological in nature and physiological. Dr. Emma Church, a clinical psychologist in Waco, says during these experiences, the brain can be stuck in this state. With people with PTSD, oftentimes they are not able to access those higher level functionings. Behind me are two different brain scans. The one to your left is a normal functioning brain. Now these two areas are called your temporal lobes and this is your frontal lobe cortex. That determines how you feel and how you act. Now this red area is exactly what you want to see, high functioning brain activity. Now if you go to the other brain, this is someone consistent of someone who's been through domestic violence or have been diagnosed with PTSD. Now limited to no red activity in your temporal lobes as well as your frontal lobe cortex. Now that can make you numb, unapparent to what's going on in the world. Now, two different brains functioning two different ways. Scans that show big impacts on a person. We see hyper arousal, so any little sound can be, feel like a danger. There might be paranoia or this thought that everybody's going to hurt me. I may experience dreams, nightmares, flashbacks. David Blackburn with Baylor Scott White weighing in. And the challenge is to help the person work through the trauma so that they can come out on the other side recognizing that was then the past. It's clear it can take a toll, but through help, a person can repair. Getting you to feel how you used to be. Thinking like yourself and understanding the world around you once again. Now, there are ways to get help. Talk to someone you trust, call a local shelter or crisis center, or contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-7233. There are dozens of local shelters across Central Texas, and just to name a few, families in crisis in both Temple and Killeen, there are two numbers for them, 254-634-1184 or 254-773-7765. And the phone number for the Family Abuse Center here in Waco is 1-800-283-8401. And remember, if you are in immediate danger, don't be afraid to call 911. That'll do it tonight for our domestic violence coverage. Caleb Chevalier is up next with a look at your forecast. And Good Morning Texas is back tomorrow to kick off your day starting at 5 a.m. Thanks for joining us and have a good night.